Hello and welcome. Today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about console along with Kubernetes. I think when we talk about Kubernetes and console, I think there's often a bit of confusion around, you know, what exactly does it solve? Doesn't Kubernetes have its own built-in service discovery? You know, how do these two systems work together? And so I think if we start by talking about Kubernetes, then, you know, yes, at the core, Kubernetes does include a basic form of service discovery within any given cluster. So if I have a single Kubernetes cluster and I have applications A and B, and they're running within that cluster, then they can use Kubernetes as native DNS-based service discovery to find and route to one another within that cluster. Where console really starts to play a role is once we start to draw a slightly more complicated picture. So I think for a lot of folks, their challenge is they don't have a single Kubernetes cluster, they actually have multiple, right? So you might have a different cluster with let's say other applications running on them. And now the challenge is how do the applications on cluster one discover and talk to applications in cluster two? So this becomes one of the first areas where the value of console comes to play around how do we do this type of service discovery, right? So console can actually span all of that and act as a single consistent registry across multiple different clusters. So we can actually sync and integrate with the native registry that Kubernetes has and create more of a global visibility of, hey, here's all of the different services. And that way applications within a cluster can query console to be able to route and talk to, to services in a different cluster. Now this extends beyond just multiple Kubernetes clusters. We might actually have applications that run outside of Kubernetes entirely, right? So for example, you might have a VM based application, you know, that might still be registered with console and we want to enable those applications to interoperate. So A might want to discover E or vice versa. E might want to discover A running within Kubernetes. And then we might also have other platforms, right? We might be using, for example, ECS as a different container native platform within Amazon. And great, we still have a service discovery challenge of how do all these things talk to one another. So the first layer where console really comes in is acting as sort of a universal service discovery layer. That might be you know, across multiple Kubernetes clusters, it might be between our Kubernetes and our VM-based workloads, or it might span multiple container native platforms such as ECS and Kubernetes. So this becomes kind of the first part is how do all these things discover one another? And then we can even connect that service discovery to solutions like API gateways. So console has native support for an Envoy-based API gateway, but it also integrates with popular solutions like Trafic, Nginx, HAProxy, Kong, et cetera. So those API gateways can also similarly query console and say, great, you know, if this request is coming in and we need to route to the service, where is that service running, right? And there's potentially multiple copies of it, so we need to load balance across them. So in this first level challenge, it's really around how do we create a single universal directory of where all of our different services are running that's sort of a service registry that allows all of our applications to query it to do service discovery. And then we can integrate with things like API gateways to enable that sort of discovery challenge. So that's layer one, is really just solving the connectivity challenge across all of these different systems. Layer two, as we start getting a little bit more sophisticated, is how do we really start to think about service mesh, right? So like I said, if we start, it's really around service discovery first and the core catalog. And then the more sophisticated use cases we start getting deeper is service mesh. Now with service mesh, I think there's multiple different benefits we start to get. At the core, what does really service mesh even mean? It's really a disaggregated pattern. Rather than us trying to push all the traffic through a central set of load balancers and firewalls and WAFs and all these sort of network middleware, instead what we're doing is saying we're gonna push a set of software proxies or sidecars to the edge. So alongside these applications, we're gonna run a proxy, for example, Envoy. And these proxies are running sort of everywhere, right? They're alongside these various applications. And now the problem with having proxies distributed everywhere is that you don't want to have to manage configuration distributed across thousands or tens of thousands of nodes. So while we're distributing the data plane everywhere with the proxies, running everywhere. We're centralizing the control plane and the management metadata to some more central, such as console. So that really becomes the heart of service mesh. 
The value of doing that is now we can start to define various types of controls. One very key one becomes how do we sort of micro segment our network or how do we have explicit security controls around who's allowed to talk to who. So we might want to define, for example, a central rule that says, yeah, service A is allowed to talk to service C. So we're going to define that rule using the logical identity of the application, in this case, service A and service C. I don't actually care what their IP address is, but now what we've done is we've segmented the network. We're saying, great, A can't talk to anything it wants, but it can talk to C, right? And so how does that actually work? Well, great, what we're actually going to do is push down a set of certificates to all of the applications that are registered with console running in service mesh mode. So there'll be a TLS certificate that gets pushed down to either, to all of these applications. That certificate follows a common format known as Spiffy. And so this provides a universal way to encode effectively the identity of that service. So we know this is identity of the service as C within that certificate in a way that can be authenticated peer to peer. So we don't have to go talk to a central system. When A initiates a connection directly to C, they're gonna both present their certificates and establish a mutual TLS session. So this encrypts all the traffic that's moving between these applications, but allows C to inspect A's certificate and validate that, yep, that is in fact service A. Service A can validate C's certificate and say that is in fact service C. And then they can check against a logical rule that says, should service A and C be allowed to communicate, yes or no? If yes, great, we allow this traffic pattern to take place and you know, services can talk. If no, we're gonna close that connection and generate an error basically saying service A and C shouldn't be talking to each other. You know, we're gonna reject that. So this becomes sort of, I think, the core approach to how we start thinking about sort of segmenting our networks, right? And oftentimes we're sort of referred to this as a micro segmentation. And the reason it's a micro segment is we're not talking about segmenting on a coarse grain network boundary. All of these applications might be in the same subnet or in the same VPC, right? But what we're now saying is it's a very micro segment, even though they might be on the same subnet. In fact, they might be on the same IP address. We're still segmenting to just those services that really should be allowed to talk to each other. So B might be on the same machine as A, but it doesn't have any authority to talk to C, right? Unlike a traditional network-based approach where you might segment a whole you know, subnet at a time using a firewall or security group rule, right? So this allows us to get a little bit more segmented. Now, as we start getting a little bit fancier, because we're traveling through these proxies, and these proxies are sort of smart, they're aware of the protocol, the traffic is flowing through them, we can actually start to do a little bit more interesting things, for example, with layer seven, management of traffic. So we might actually want to look and say, hey, based on various paths, we're going to allow and deny that request, or based on various patterns of it. So it starts letting us get more sophisticated. We might also use layer seven within an API gateway path to say, great, you know, if it's slash foo, that goes to service A, but if it's slash bar, you know, that might go to our traditional VM-based service, in this case, service E, right? So we can start integrating with service mesh some of these level seven constructs, such as path-based routing, you know, more sophisticated policy at that protocol-aware layer to start doing more interesting things around traffic management, routing, et cetera. Then the last piece is really how do you enable more observability, right? And so these proxies, by virtue of sitting in the data path, can collect pretty rich telemetry, right? We can look at how many requests are being made between A and C, what is the error rate, what is the latency, and so all of that telemetry gets collected by these proxies, and then they can export that to a system, whether that's Datadog or Prometheus or a different APM system. So as a user, you can come in and say, hey, I wanna understand, you know, where am I, what's my error rate between these services? You know, how much traffic is flowing between all my different applications? I can kind of see that uh, through my telemetry and monitoring systems because the mesh is enabling me to collect that and have all of that observability data, right? So these become some of the really core benefits as we talk about service mesh is really thinking about the security improvements, the manageability around layer four and layer seven. Obviously we don't have to only work at layer, you know, uh, layer seven, we can also do layer four policies. And then observability, can we actually see it and profile our network and get a better sense of what's actually happening? Those are some of the core values. Now the final piece is we really think about broadening this to really what's the end to end of automating a network is that oftentimes in between some of these applications, we still have traditional network middleware, 
right? So it might be that in between service A and service E, we actually have a firewall, right? E might be a, you know, a database, for example, right? And so how do we sort of update these things? Often what we end up saying is great, our application might be running in Kubernetes, we're maybe auto-scaling it in an automated way, but then we have to file a ticket and wait for someone to manually update the firewall, for example. So this is where our console is actually integrated with Terraform. So what we allow you to do is define with sort of infrastructure as code using a Terraform template, how you should manage these network appliances. So the network appliance might be you know, a firewall, might be a load balancer, might be an API gateway, might be an underlying, you know, network fabric, right, if you're using, you know, an SDN or something. And so we can define with a Terraform module and an infrastructure as code way, what are the inputs to that? And how should we configure the firewall without managing specific IP addresses? And then we connect that to console using what we call the console Terraform sync. So that basically acts as a bridge between console and Terraform so that as something like service A gets deployed, service A then might register a new IP address for that service. We can then pick that up. Oh, this should actually connect to console. Service, that will get registered with console. We will detect that change and automatically invoke the appropriate Terraform script, which then will update the firewall in an automated way. So from our app team's perspective, we just deploy and manage our applications. We don't actually have to care how the network works. That just gets registered and automatically updated. Rather than the developer having to know, oh, I have to file a ticket now to manually go update my firewall or my load balancer or whatever to actually get traffic. So when we sort of zoom out, what we're really trying to enable here with console is that focus on the application. The app team should really focus on being able to deploy their app, manage that, and then the network should be automated around them. Whether that's API gateway allowing traffic to come in, whether that's east-west in terms of what are the policies that allow you to discover and secure your connection to these other services, or if there's middleware such as load balancers, firewalls, etc., how do those get updated automatically to support the application without having to file a ticket, right? So all of this and this piece really becomes around that network automation. So all of this together is really how we think about doing service networking end to end and where console integrates and supports Kubernetes. Now, if you're asking, okay, great, what are the start points? How do users actually interface with this, deploy this, manage this? There's a number of different ways, right? You can deploy console directly onto Kubernetes using a Helm chart. So we have native Helm charts to be able to do that. At the same time, we also have what we call the console Kubernetes CLI. So you can use that as well to deploy and manage console running on top of Kubernetes. And then there's a number of ways to interface with it. If users are more comfortable and they want to specify CRDs directly against Kubernetes, they can do that and use native YAML, native CRDs, native sort of Kubernetes workflow, define their policies and controls within Kubernetes, and that will get synced with console. Or if they want, they can interface directly with console as well. And that has a number of different endpoints, whether that's a CLI-based approach, API-based approach, infrastructure as code using Terraform, a UI, et cetera. So, you know, there's kind of multiple paths in. For the Kubernetes native user, they might be more comfortable with a CRD. But if you're doing more sophisticated tooling, you might want to use the API or the Terraform provider directly to manage that all, right? So hopefully this gives a sense of how these systems work together you know, I think what's exciting is when we, we talk about some of the case studies, folks like Datadog who use console and talk about how they manage that across dozens of Kubernetes clusters. It's really about enabling the developers to really go fast and focus on their application and not have to really think about the networking that supports that underneath. Hopefully this was helpful just to learn a little bit more about how console and Kubernetes work together. Thanks so much.